When he made me, God entrusted me to two good parents, including a mother, who's seated here tonight, who loves books and who read consistently to us as we were growing up. Just as weekly attendance at church and Sunday school was part of what it meant to belong to my family, so too was my mother reading to each of us, my two older brothers and me, every night at bedtime. These rituals were part of our lives well past the age when most of my friends were no longer tucked into bed or read to or made to go to church by their parents. Even into my brother's teen years, our mother made the rounds to each separate bedroom, reading a section nightly from books of our choosing. One rare occasion, my mother being out, my father put me to bed. While reading me my requisite bedtime story, he arrived at a place in the book where my mother, instead of reading the words, would instead make the sound. My poor father, ignorant of this particular tradition, made the mistake of saying the words, sniff, sniff, instead of making the sound, and suffered a haughty correction from me. I learned to read on my own with Dr. Seuss's The Foot Book in my room, using a finger to trace each word as I sounded it out. An older playmate nearby, engrossed silently in another book, gave me an exasperated shh as I pronounced every word indignant at being shushed while carrying out such a significant task as reading by myself, I soldiered on, whispering, in the house and on the street, how many, many feet you meet. I remember the titles, pictures, and the words of so many favorite books, the colorful chaos of Richard Scarry's busy, busy world, the tale of Ralph, the rodent with the helmet made of half a ping pong ball in the mouse and the motorcycle, the story of the inimitable and enviable anti-hero uh, Harriet the Spy, that tomboy of tomboys, Ramona the Brave, the smart and sassy Nancy Drew, the delightful and whimsical Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, and Where the Red Fern Grows, which left me weeping inconsolably the night I finished it alone, lying in the top bed of my, my bedroom. Books and the reading of books fill the memories of my early childhood as much as anything else does. My childhood rituals of reading encompassed a complicated set of ceremonies, rules, and traditions not unlike those of the church. More than anything else, books have formed me, body and soul. Although being raised by God-loving parents is no guarantee that one will love God oneself, it certainly helps. I did love God, even if it didn't always show, but for much of my life, I loved books more than God, never discovering for a long, long time that a God who spoke the world into existence with words is, in fact, the source of all words and all that is good. I thought of my love of, my love of books was taking me away from God, but as it turns out, books were the backwards path to God bramble-filled and broken, yes, but full of truth and wonder. After all, great literature demands readers to consider in one way or another good questions. Who am I? What is my place in the world? And how should I live? My literary and spiritual memoir, Booked, Literature in the Soul of Me, examines the way visions of the good life were implanted in me by great books. From great expectations, I learned the power the stories we, te we tell ourselves have to do either harm or good to ourselves and to others. From Madame Bovary, I learned to embrace the real world rather than escaping into flights of fancy. From Gulliver's Travels, I learned the profound limitations of my own finite perspective. From Tess of the D'Urbervilles, I saw the power of grace and the tragedy of its absence. And from Gerard Manley Hopkins, I came to love the pied beauty of the world and in me. In my book In Progress, which is the working title, the working title of which is the same as this lecture, The Good Life in Great Books, I am exploring the way classic literature embodies the heights and depths of the human condition. How Paradise Lost harnesses and unleashes the power of imagination. How Dr. Faustus exposes the way temptation can lead to damnation. And the Canterbury Tales delight in the variety and range of human character. What Huckleberry Finn teaches about courage 
and to kill a mockingbird about justice. How Voltaire's Candide reminds us that simplicity is sometimes the best response to the chaos of human experience. And the way Oscar Wilde reminds us of the importance of laughter and how the dark dystopia of Cormac McCarthy's The Road conveys the, the saving power of love. These aren't mere intellectual or moral lessons, although they certainly may begin as such. Rather, the stories and images and ideas from these books and so many others fill the imagination with patterns and practices toward a good life. Imagination is, after all, the expression of the creator showing forth his image in the creation. To imagine is to mirror God in us. Imagination is the bridge between word and world. Through imagination, words become images or ideas which then become ways of being and acting in the world. This is why, in his book Imagining the Kingdom, James K. A. Smith says that imagination is fundamentally aesthetic in nature. As human beings' meaning-making faculty, imagination is the force that presses us, making impressions on us and in us. Being made in the image of God, the process of imaging or imagining is a simultaneous and reciprocal receiving and sending forth. Imagination is both mimetic and generative. Without imagination, we are mere animals, worms living out our days in the dark. Literature makes concrete, it embodies, it incarnates the abstractions of ideas and ideals. Good books tap into the powers of imagination to allow us to picture the possibilities, both bright and dark, for human existence, possibilities we might not otherwise know. As C.S. Lewis has famously observed, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We cannot desire what we cannot imagine, and we cannot imagine what we have not seen. This is why Jamie Smith again explains that imagination precedes desire, because actions are pulled out of us according to our vision of the good life and what it means to be human. Smith says we first imagine what we ought to love, because significance for creatures like us is first and foremost incarnate. He uses the metaphor of an inscription to describe the way in which we are recruited to visions of the good life apart from our conscious choosing. It's not a question of whether you're being conscripted to some vision of the good life, it's which vision of the good life. And so it is from Jane Eyre that I learned in part how to be myself like Jane, I had a very strong sense of myself from a young age. Unlike Jane, however, my strong sense of self was nourished by my parents. Even so, I did not feel, because I was not, self-possessed. I had a sense of who I was, but I wasn't yet comfortable in my own skin. Outside the protective buffer of parental love and encouragement, I, like Jane, had a sense of not really belonging. I was sufficiently like my youthful peers to have friends enough and social opportunities enough, but I still didn't feel like I exactly fit in. It was quite a challenge for a girl, plain and small like me, to be interesting to and among, among others who seemed agonizingly not so plain and not so uninteresting, not so ill-fitted to everyone else around me. I did not see then that adolescence is isolating for everyone, even the shiny-haired, smooth-skinned girls and the athletic, poised, unclumsy girls and the girls the boys flocked around and the girls who got the highest grades all the time, girls not like me. Just as Leo Tolstoy famously observed in Anna Karenina that happy families are all alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, the unhappiness of adolescence is unique to each one of us. Even so, Jane Eyre seemed in so many ways to be someone like me. In reading and studying the book many more times later in life, I came to realize that this was because she really was. In Jane, I beheld one of the most realistic characters I had yet encountered in the considerable number of novels I'd read in my youth. 
For unlike most literary heroines, Jane Eyre is not striking, beautiful, or even pretty. In fact, Jane Eyre is quite remarkable in being quite plain. In fact, Charlotte Bronte specifically set out to create just such a character, an act no less than revolutionary for a novel writer of the time. Her friend and biographer and fellow novelist Elizabeth Gaskell reported that Br Bronte proclaimed of Jane, I will show you a heroine as plain and small as myself who shall be as interesting as any of yours. Centuries of English and European literary tradition had offered up female characters who were angels or whores, pure or fallen, damsels or crones. In stark relief, Jane Eyre is one of the first female characters to fall uncomfortably, realistically, in the middle position between utter perfection and hopeless ruin, the place where all mere mortals are to be found. She is neither sweet nor complacent, but strong-willed and determined, nor is she wretched and fallen, but a faithful and sincere Christian. I am not an angel, she asserts, and I will not be one till I die. I will be myself. Jane Eyre offers a vision for one of the most significant of human quests, the quest for identity. We all must navigate through endless possibilities of being and overcome countless temptations to become any person but one that reflects both the givenness of our being and the possibilities of our becoming. Beholding is becoming, as the philosopher Mar Marshall McLuhan was known for saying. By beholding the world around us, we can capture a vision for the good life by finding our rightful place in the world. As creatures made for community, we form and know our identity only in the context of community. Through imagination, great books allow us to behold characters, places, situations, and ideas far beyond where our bodies can take us. In this way, great books expand our communities and thereby expand the possibilities of our visions for the good life. Yet, while a good life does require a sense of oneself, the vision for the good life cannot be centered on one's own life. But rather, the truly good life requires us to imagine our place within a community. As John Donne so memorably reminds us in his Meditation 17, written in reflection upon the death of an anonymous fellow citizen, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. And in a particularly apt metaphor in the same meditation, Don compares humanity to a book. He writes, all mankind is of one author and is one volume. When one man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book, but translated into a better language. And every chapter must be so translated. God employs several translators. Some pieces are translated by age, some by sickness, some by war, some by justice. But God's hand is in every translation, and his hand shall bind up all our scattered leaves again for that library where every book shall lie open to one another. Death reminds Dunn and us that we are all pages of one book. And so perhaps the best vision for the good life, which is but one page in a great book, begins with the knowledge of death, with knowledge of the inevitability of death and the limit of our mortal frame and earthly existence. To know that we will surely die can guide us in knowing how to live. There may be no book more fit to begin with than Leo Tolstoy's short novel, a long parable in fact, The Death of Ivan Ilyik, which begins with the announcement of Ilyik's death at age 45. But the family and colleagues who soon gather do not see death in this death. Rather, they see only how their lives are affected by the event, the inconveniences, the advancements, the necessary socializing. Indeed, Tolstoy writes, each one thought or felt, well, he's dead, but I'm alive. So too had Ilyik's blindness been, as we learn in the first sentence of the second chapter. Ivan Ilyik's life had been most simple and most ordinary, and therefore most terrible. The narrator then takes us through Ilyik's life, his schooling, his career success, his marriage and fatherhood, all carried out according to the routine of secular ritual, 
in accordance to a received vision of how a successful life should go, one easily, pleasantly, and decorously lived, decorously lived. It is literally while decorating that Ivan Ilyich suffers his fall. In a sumptuous new home arrived at in consequence of one more career advancement, Ivan becomes seized by the task of adorning the home. While hanging his new drapes, he slips and falls, bruising his side. Weeks and months pass. One symptom leads to another. The doctors are unable to arrive at a diagnosis. Pain takes over, and Ivan's ability to take pleasure in the life he has worked toward diminishes. In response to his illness, his wife and daughter muster only the feelings of annoyance. In the face of his family's indifference, Ivan begins to feel hatred. His physical pain increases as to his spiritual and emotional anguish that nothing he has achieved in this life means anything. As his condition worsens, he discovers rather accidentally that his pain is alleviated by his servant holding up his legs. This common peasant, Gerasim, is the only, only kind, compassionate person in Ivan's life and in his death. As death draws near, Ivan's torments increase. Opium alleviates some of the physical suffering, but there seems no relief from his spiritual anguish. One night he cries out in anger to the God he had ignored his whole life. Why hast thou done all this? Why hast thou brought me here? Why dost thou torment me so terribly? And in imagination, he began to recall the best moments of his pleasant life. But strange to say, none of those best moments of his pleasant life now seemed at all what they had seemed. It is as if I had been going downhill while I imagined I was going up. And that is really what it was. I was going up in public opinion, but to the same extent, life was ebbing away from me. And now it is all done, and there is only death. He, th he says, one night, gazing into Gerasim's face, Ivan Ilyich suddenly wonders, what if my whole life has been wrong? In facing this question, his mental sufferings become even worse than his physical pain. He screams for the last three days of his life. In the midst of this, two hours before his death, he finally asks himself, but what is the right thing? And upon asking this question, he felt that someone was kissing his hand. He opened his eyes, looked at his son, and felt sorry for him. His wife came up to him and he glanced at her. She was gazing at him open-mouthed with undried tears on her nose and cheek and a despairing look on her face. He felt sorry for her too. And suddenly it grew clear to him that what had been oppressing him and would not leave his, his side was all dropping away at once from both sides, from ten sides, from all sides. He was sorry for them. He must act so as not to hurt them, release them, and free himself from these sufferings. How good and how simple, he thought. And the pain, he asked himself, what was become of it? Where, where are you, pain? He turned his attention to it. Yes. Here it is. Well, what of it? Let the pain be. And death? Where is it? He sought his former accustomed fear of death and did not find it. Where is it? What death? There was no fear because there was no death. In place of death, there was light. So that's what it is, he suddenly exclaimed aloud. What joy! To him, the narrator tells us, all this happened in a single instant, and the meaning of that instant did not change. For those present, his agony continued for another two hours. Something rattled in his throat, his emaciated body twitched, then the gasping and rattle became less and less frequent. It is finished, said someone near him. He heard these words and repeated them in his soul. Death is finished, he said to himself. It is no more. He drew in a breath, stopped in the midst of a sigh, stretched out, and died. These are the last words of the story. In death, Ivan Ilyich finds his vision for the good life. Indeed, he finds life itself. It happens that my most re recent rereading of the death of Ivan Ilyich took place amidst intimations of mortality in my own life. 
I think I am like most of us in wanting to shield myself from the intimate, uncomfortable, messy processes that mark the ending stages of life. We live in a culture that keeps death, dying, and aging as far from most of us for as long as possible. Geography often separates us from the aging of our elders and medical science from that of ourselves. I have been given the gift, however, of having my aging parents and my aged grandmother, who turns 101 in a couple of weeks, <laughs> brought back into close proximity and with them the bodily presence of the sights, sounds, scents, and servitude of illness and aging. And so it happened that the day before I bore helpless witness quite recently to my father's groanings in a hospital bed, I had reread the pages of Ivan Ilyich's last fear and scream-filled days. Reading Ivan prepared me for something I didn't know I needed to be prepared for. In something terrible, I could behold something less terrible, something good even, because I knew that it was a terrible thing that binds all of humanity together the bearing of one another's burdens. My father is well now, by the way, but one day he, like all of us here, won't be. Death will come, and when he does, he will not be a stranger. Death is the shadow that has trailed us all our days, come round to meet us at the front door. How we die will depend on how we live, as the death of Ivan Ilyich shows. Ivan learns in time to find redemption. But Willie Lohman in Death of a Salesman does not. Often in great literature, the vision for the good life is cast by negative example, as is the case in this play. Willie Lohman leads a, a life much like Ivan Ilyich's, average, materialistic, driven by a sense of decorum dictated by a corrupted version of the American dream. When the play opens, Willie is not dead as Ivan Ilyich was, but he is dying. His memory is failing. Willie constantly tells his sons that the key to success in life is being well-liked. But as his appearances decline and his old contacts disappear, Willie's sales naturally diminish. As Willie feels more and more like a failure, these feelings put into motion a self-fulfilling prophecy and his failures increase until he is fired and his world crashes. The title of the work has two references in the play, and they are inextricably linked. The first is the ending, which leaves the salesman, Willie Lohman, dead. The other reference is found in passing in the play. It's a story of another salesman, Dave Singleman, whom Willie met years before when Dave was 84 years old and Willie was a young man. Dave, Willie says, would put on his green velvet slippers and pick up his phone and call the buyers, and without ever leaving his room, he made his living beholden to a vision for success that belonged to someone else, Willie decided that selling was the greatest career a man could want. What could be more satisfying, he asked. For when Dave Singleman died all those years ago, Willie tells his boss later, he died the death of a salesman, in his green velvet slippers in the smoker of the New York, New Haven, and New Hartford, going into Boston. When he died, hundreds of salesmen and buyers were at his funeral. This is the desire formed in Willie's imagination, conscripted within him deeper and deeper over time as he lives his life according to the patterns and rituals of an empty American dream, one marked by shiny cars, new appliances, and whipped cheese in a can. This false vision of the good life that drives him for the rest of his life and ultimately drives him to his death as the vision falters and with it Willie's own imagination, Willie emerges from one of his reveries into the past with the sudden realization that in his life, he says, nothing's planted. I don't have a thing in the ground. So he rushes off to get some seeds. His son Biff finds him later outside late at night planting the seeds. The action is emblematic. It's not literal seeds that Willie has neglected to plant but the seeds of enduring real values that he realizes only now that he has failed to implant in his sons. Biff says to Willie, we never told the truth for 10 minutes in this house. Biff goes on to tell Willie that Willie has blown uh, Biff so full of hot air while he was has growing up, 
the hot air of unrealistic expectations and false illusions that Biff never understood what was required in order to achieve real success. But now, at last, Biff realizes who he is and who he is not. And he says that all I want is out there waiting for me the minute I say I know who I am. Why did Willie's life as a salesman constitute the pursuit of a false dream? Because, as the play makes clear, Willie suppressed his real nature and sold himself out to become something he wasn't called to be. As we learn from various revelations in the work, it wasn't making sales that made Willie happy, it was making things with his hands. Reflecting upon Willie's self-inflicted death, his son Biff Marks remarks, there were a lot of nice days. When he'd come home from a trip or on Sundays making the stoop, finishing the cellar, putting on the new porch, when he built the bedroom and put up the garage, there's more of him in that front stoop than in all the sales he made. After Willie's death, immediately following his funeral, Willie's son Biff says of him, he had the wrong dreams, all, all wrong. He never knew who he was. The man didn't know who he was. Death of a Salesman is one of my favorite plays to teach to my college students. They are, it, these students are in one of the most vulnerable places in life, in that liminal space between dependence and independence, between adolescence and adulthood. They come to college thinking they are possessed of a vision of the good life. But more often than not, it is a vision they have merely received, not one they have co-created. They do not know who they are. Who they think they are is usually a collage of fragments formed from parental expectations, peer influence, and increasingly social media images. But the work of their own imaginations, through exposure to great books and great ideas, helps them, as it helps all of us, to achieve the self-knowledge vital to casting a vision for the good life that is particularly fitted for them. The creative power of the imagination is the source of such a vision. In a very important essay by Graham Ward called How Literature Resists Secularity, Ward explains that the human ability to imagine goes beyond mere mimesis or mimicking when it starts to create, to fashion. Ward writes, human beings do not just live in the world, they produce it. Books change us, Ward explains, because reading is one of various practices that, quote, form, transform, and refigure subjectivities and knowledges of self and world, informing the soul and writing upon the body. Almost defiantly, Ward proclaims, there are books that have changed people's lives. But in recent decades, as the concept of the good life has fallen, fallen away, for who can define what is good anyway, so too has the idea of great books, for who is to judge what constitutes greatness. This being the case, why study literature at all? Gary Saul Morrison, a professor at Northwestern University who teaches Russian literature in classes that seat hundreds of students at a time, published an essay this summer in commentary titled, why college kids are avoiding the study of literature. Resisting the easy assumption that the problem is kids today, Morrison points instead to the way the teaching of literature today has tended to cut out all the, all the pounds of flesh and left only the bones. Students no longer desire to read, Morrison says, not because they don't desire wisdom and guidance toward the good life, but because they don't see reading books as a source for this. When all that's required by educators can be gleaned from skimming the Wikipedia summary, the form and practice of reading itself is neglected. Focusing on the technical aspects of literature as mere craft or on an abstract literary theory, on judgment of, of the text by present day ideas, or on context at the expense of text, all these approaches, Morrison says, serve to diminish the way the author creates an experience for the reader. And I'm going to give a long quote from Morrison here because it's quite um, illustrative. He writes, It is really quite remarkable what happens when reading a great novel. By identifying with a character, you learn from within what it feels like to be someone else. 
Reading a novel, you experience the perceptions, values, and quandaries of a person from an, another epoch, society, religion, social class, culture, gender, or personality type. By practice, we learn what it is like to perceive, experience, and evaluate the world in various ways. This is the very opposite of measuring people in terms of our values. To be sure, there are other disciplines that sometimes tell us we should empathize, but only literature offers constant practice in doing so. We follow the life of Dorothea Brooke or David Copperfield moment to moment, and we live with them for hundreds of hours, always living into their experience, growing along with them, approving or disapproving their choices, and perhaps changing our minds as they change theirs. This long process offers a lot of practice and empathy, enough to make it a habit. Students will acquire the skill to inhabit the author's world. Her perspective becomes one with which they are intimate and which when their own way of thinking leads them to a dead end, they can temporarily adopt to see if it might help. Novelistic empathy gives them a diversity of ways of thinking and feeling. They can escape from the prison house of self." End quote. It is characteristic of the modern age that when we think of great books, we most often think of prose, of fiction and novels. So let me pause here to say a word about that orphan of modern literature, poetry. As the form of literature that uses language in the most condensed fashion, poetry magnifies the power of all literary art to break down these walls of the prison house of self Morrison talks about. Poetry binds likeness to likeness, word to music, image to sensation, while the rest of the world divides and derides, pushes away and pushes apart, confronts and affronts, poetry brings together. While the world spots differences, poetry seeks semblances. It is a ministry of reconciliation, of weaving a fractured, fallen world back together, word by word, of gathering up scattered pieces of brokenness and gluing them back together again, like a cracked china cup in which meaning is served to overflowing. All literary writing, not just poetry, all writing that uses language artistically so that it both teaches and delights, in the wor words of Horace and Ars Poetica, has this socializing effect on us. More and more studies confirm that emotional intelligence, empathy, and social perception are measurably improved after test subjects read literary fiction in particular. Researchers attribute this outcome to the role the imagination plays in reading such literature. Reading requires our minds to make inferences, interpret nuanced indicators, gauge emotions, and predict outcomes, just like we must do in real life. In emphasizing showing rather than telling, literary fiction allows readers to do more interpretive work in discerning the meaning of a story. Such activity recreates the interpretive work we do as we interact with real people, reading them and the situations we find ourselves in every day, all day. So it's not just what great books tell us that leads to the good life, it's how they tell us. As we read in Pride and Prejudice about Elizabeth Bennet, we also read with her. As we see through her eyes her first impressions, which was Austen's original title of the novel, we misread along with her the character of Mr. Darcy. We are duped into trusting Elizabeth's perspective because it seems to us and to her so eminently trustworthy. Recoiling with her at Mr. Dar Darcy's unmistakable pride, we turn out to be prejudiced. Reading this book is an act of meta-reading. It is reading about reading, reading about misreading, a lesson in hermeneutic humility, as is all literary reading. Reading, unlike spoken language, does not come naturally to human beings. It must be taught. It must be practiced. Because it goes beyond mere biology, there is something profoundly spiritual about the human ability and impulse to read. In fact, even the various senses in which we use the word captures this. To read means not only to decipher a given and learned set of symbols in a mechanistic way, but it also suggests that very human act of finding meaning, of interpreting in the sense of reading people and situations. 
To read in this sense might be considered one of the most spiritual of all human activities. Eugene H. Peterson explains in his book, Eat This Book, quote, reading is an immense gift, but only if the words are assimilated, taken into the soul, eaten, chewed, gnawed, and received in unhurried delight, end quote. Peter describes this ancient art of Lectio Divina, or spiritual reading, as reading that enters our souls as food enters our stomachs, spreads through our blood, and becomes love and wisdom, end quote. More than the books themselves, then, it is the skills and the desire to read in this way which comprise the essential gift great books bestow, the ability to transcend the immediacy of the material, the moment, or even the moral choice at hand. Indeed, studies in neuroscience, psychology, and cognitive science show that this deep reading, slow, immersive, rich in sensory detail and emotional and moral complexity, is a distinctive experience, a kind of reading that differs in kind and quality from the mere decoding of words that constitutes a good deal of what passes for reading in this digital age. Literary critic Frank Kermode distinguishes between what he calls carnal reading characterized by the hurried utilitarian information processing that constitutes the bulk of our daily reading diet, and spiritual reading, reading done with focused attention for pleasure, reflection, analysis, and growth. Great books expand the imagination then, not only by enlarging our field of vision beyond the limits of our finite experience, but also in teaching us how to find and make meaning. While mathematics, philosophy, and psychology and other fields are also endeavors of making sense out of the universe, several characteristics of fiction in particular reflect the human condition in ways distinct to storytelling. Stories take place in linear time and thus imitate our sense of our earthly existence, which also has a beginning, middle, and end. Even stories that play with linear time do so because they are rooted in it. The heart of every story is a conflict. Without a conflict and the events that lead to and follow it, there is no story but mere, merely a list of events. This center of a story, this conflict, is the very phenomenon that creates our need to make meaning out of our lives. For conflict lies at the heart of the ultimate story of human existence, creation, fall, and redemption. The essential human conflict is the rupture of our, hum of our union with God and stories embody truth in a way that parallels the incarnation. Metaphorically, stories, drama, and poetry put flesh on ideas so they can dwell among us. Because literature embodies the linearity and connectivity of our conflict-ridden lives, reading is practice in making meaning out of the human condition. Again, to return to Smith and Imagining the Kingdom, he says, perception is already an evaluation that primes me to act in certain ways. The person with good character has herself or been taught by those around her to see situations in the right way, end quote. It is what, we, what again, Kermode calls spiritual reading, not merely decoding, that unleashes the power that good literature has to reach into our souls and in so doing, draw and connect us to others. As Graham Ward argues in the essay I cited earlier, all literary reading is spiritual. The persuasiveness of literature, what the po poet Samuel T. Coleridge describes as poetic faith, Ward says, leaves, quote, an indelible imprint upon our emotional capacity to respond and our imaginative, imaginative capacity to empathize, end quote. No image of the good life is possible apart from a vision of the good of others. This truth is reflected in the very nature of the triune God whose own nature bespeaks community and whose creative act in making humankind formed us for fellowship with him and one another. This is why the way we read can be even more important than what we read. Reading good literature won't make a, a reader a better person any more than sitting in a church, synagogue, or mosque will. But reading good books well just might. 
In explaining the inherently religious nature of literature, Ward explains that both the act of writing and the act of reading, like the act of religious piety, involve practices of believing. Because metaphors not only transport, he says, they transfigure. And here, perhaps, is where we run into the limits of even great literature. Because even great literature, uh, the limits that great literature has to cultivate and do good. For books, like metaphors, are merely a picture, an image, a likeness, a glass through which we see darkly. They are the medium, not the origin or the end. Books, even great ones, cannot save us. But perhaps the best books, at the very least, show us that we cannot save ourselves either. But their words, rightly written and rightly read, might point us to the word that can. Thank you.